Okay, everyone, I think we've got most people in the door. We've got 36 according to the screen. Um, my name's Siobhan Lavelle. I'm a member of the ASHA um, committee, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's seminar, which is part of the ASHA 2023 seminar series. I'm calling in from the land of the Darug and Gumnangurra people um, in an area just west of Sydney in New South Wales. ASHA acknowledges the traditional owners of country and recognises their continuing connection to lands, waters, sky and community. We pay our respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures, to other First Nations peoples on the land on which we meet this evening, and also to elders past and present. We're very fortunate tonight that our seminar on, the women, on women and their houses in Victorian New Zealand is being presented by Dr. Catherine Watson, who is an archaeologist based in Otutahi Christchurch. She recently completed her PhD at the University of Canterbury. The research analysed 101 houses to better understand why people built the houses they did and what life was like in 19th century Christchurch. Catherine is now working as a consultant and helps run the Christchurch Archaeology Project, which is a not-for-profit set up to preserve, share and research Otutahi Christchurch's archaeological heritage. Catherine is also a member of the Heritage New Zealand Pohiri Taonga Board. So welcome, Catherine, and over to you. Uh, thanks, Siobhan. I hope everybody can hear me. If not, I guess just message through and someone will hopefully help you out or let me know if there's a problem at my end. Um, so kia ora koutou. I'm Tonight I'm going to be sharing with you the stories of three different women and the houses they lived in in 19th century Christchurch. So why these women and why these houses? Well, these houses, as Siobhan said, that, that for my PhD research, I looked at 101 houses that were demolished in Christchurch following the earthquakes of 2010 and 2011. And these were three of the houses from that sample that I analysed. And again, as Siobhan said, I was seeking to understand how Christchurch's domestic architecture developed, why houses looked the way they did, why different people built the houses they did, and then what all of this could tell us about life in 19th century Christchurch. So like any PhD, it was a fairly ambitious project, but and it's had all sorts of little other kind of offshoots of areas of interest that have fallen out of them. And one of them is this idea or this, um, this investigation, I suppose, into why, onto the relationship between women and housing. And so the reason I've ended up with th these three houses, or why I'm talking about these three houses tonight, is that the women who lived in them, and I should say at the outset that none of these women owned these houses that they that I'm talking about. Uh, and also for clarity, these, these women were all colonial settlers. They were from the United Kingdom, that I'm not talking about any Maori women tonight. So, but it just so happened that with the historical research that I did for my PhD, there was a lot of information about available about these women. In the case of one of them, it was because of her, her social status. For another, it, for the other two, it was because they ran businesses in the city. Now, as the work of Kath Bishop has shown, running a business doesn't necessarily, for a woman, a woman didn't necessarily mean that your name ended up in the paper, but it certainly helped in that process. And for these two women, that was very much the case. So my interest in this particular area of the relationship between houses and women was further spurred by reading um, some observations made by New Zealand historians and they, by their own admission, these observations or, or the questions they were posing were speculative and they wondered if perhaps houses might have fulfilled a different role for women than for men in 19th and early 20th century New Zealand. And no one has really, no one has looked at this, and I didn't look at it for my PhD either. But it's a question that intrigued me just to think about. I mean, in terms of what what was the relationship between housing and women, I guess. And when I started to look more into the types of work that's been done in this area in the past, I found a lot of historians who had looked at the gendered use of space within houses. And this comes back to the separate spheres model, which some of you are likely to be quite familiar with, others maybe not so much. So I'm going to explain it a little bit to, uh, before we get into the detail of my talk. So the idea of separate spheres grew out of um, 
early 19th century evangelical Christianity. And it essentially divided the world, and not the world, the middle class Anglo-Saxon Victorian world into two. And it is really important to keep in mind that this was a middle class ideal. It wasn't families in the working class would not have had the scope in any sense to try and embrace this ideology, even if they wanted to, and whether or not they might have wanted to is, you know, up for debate as well, obviously. But essentially, this ideal was that the world, as I say, that um, Victorian middle class world was divided into two. So on the one hand, you've got the the public sphere that is that is considered to be masculine, and it's associated with the world of work. And one of the principles I suppose that underlies this ideology yeah, yeah. is the idea that yeah. but he's only um, the only one because they basically pasted any yeah I know can whoever has their microphone on please turn it off <laughs> thank you um so this world of work was this this public masculine world was kind of de defined by being the working world and it was this idea that essentially not to put too fine a point on it that work was was bad for men's souls basically it was going to work was was dirty and nasty I mean sometimes quite literally depending on the nature of the work you're doing well again remember I'm talking about middle class people here so probably largely office based rather than working in a factory but that being out in the world would somehow contaminate men. And so that their wives were expected to create for them at home this private feminine sanctuary that was that was would provide men with respite from this world that they could, at the end of their, their taxing working day, they would go home and their wives would look after them and, and take care of them in this beautiful kind of calm, clean space. The other aspect of this was that, of course, it was so this this feminine space of the home was supposed to grow good moral Christian children as well. And, and this the model extends to, in fact, you read in um, architectural uh, manuals and handbooks of the early 19th century where men were considered to be responsible for the exterior of the house and the form of it, whereas women were responsible for the interior. And you can see how from that you get the, the ideas of well, not the ideas, but those kind of long-held traditions that architects were men and interior designers were women. I mean, clearly that's not, not it doesn't need to be the case and isn't the case today, but for a long time, those ideas held sway within that that, that area of work. So that, that and, but there's been a lot of research done that shows that really this model was not, this ideology was not by any means embraced by everybody. And it was perhaps, I like to think of it as perhaps a spectrum where you've got at one end, you've got people who did their best to adhere to this ideology as strongly as they could. And at the other end, there were people for whom this was entirely irrelevant and meaningless. Uh, and, and the other, one of the other major critiques of the model, of course, is that it ignores the fact that women worked in the home to, to create that home, but this was not considered work in, in the model and it ignores the idea of, of servants working and all of those sorts of issues. So lots of historians have looked at houses and the use of space within houses in relation to this model and how some spaces were considered to be masculine and others were considered to be feminine, but also how porous the boundaries between these spaces were. And that again, they, this ideal was perhaps honored more in the breach than the observance. But of course, my work focused, my PhD focused on the house as a whole. And there's been, there hasn't been a great deal of work done that looks at that relationship between women and the, and the house they lived in and the role that that house might have fulfilled in their lives. And so tonight, that's what I'm looking at with the three women that I'm going to talk about. So the first of these women is Jane Torrey Gregg. And I don't, of course, have any photographs of her or any of the women I'm talking about tonight. So I'm starting with a photo, a drawing, a line drawing of the house that she lived in. Now, for anybody from Christchurch in the audience, you might recognize this as Craycroft House, which was used by the Girl Guides most recently up until the time of the earthquakes. But this was the house that Jane and her husband, John, built in the suburb, or what the suburb is now known as Kashmir. And the house was originally known as Kashmir as well. So Jane Torrey Grieg, Grieg is her maiden name. 
Uh, she was born in 1823 in the Shetland Islands. At the age of 18, she went off to India. And three years later, she mar married John Craycroft Wilson. Uh, John was recently widowed. He was 36 and he had five ch surviving children from his first marriage. So Jane was 21 at the time. And the, the two, the, the Jane and John would not have any children of their own. And so the couple live in India until 1854 when they head off to New Zealand via Australia. They make a brief stop there and then on to Christchurch. And at this point in Christchurch, they start to set up the base for what will be their future life in the city. But they don't stay very long on this particular visit. They're only there for a year, I think, if that. But it's enough time for John to buy a bunch of land and, and for them to start getting the construction of this house underway. And then John returns to India uh, and, and followed later on by Jane. And then the couple both return to New Zealand in 1859 and live out the rest of their lives there. So that's the basic framework for their lives together. But to understand Jane and her life, you need to know more about John Craycroft Wilson. And of course, there's a photograph of John. And in fact, there's been a lot written about John and very little about Jane. So to my mind, John is the ultimate colonialist. He was born in India to English parents. Uh, his father was a judge in the Madras civil service. Uh, and, and John himself, he grew up in India, went to school in England, then returned to India and joined the civil service himself and rose very quickly through the ranks to occupy quite prominent positions within, within that profession. Uh, he, it's illness that forces him and Jane to head to New Zealand in 1854. And I already mentioned the land that he buys. So just to go into a little bit more detail about that, he got a crown grant of 168 acres at the base of the Port Hills. And that was the, the heart of the Kashmir estate where Craycroft House was built. The, and you can see, obviously, that connection between the name Kashmir and Christchurch, which is spelt differently, and Kashmir in India. Uh, and the, so that's the one parcel of land that John takes up. And then he also enters into the fray of pastoral run holding and takes up, he ends up with three pastoral stations totaling 88,000 acres. There are two in North Canterbury and one in Mid Canterbury. And this is, in New Zealand terms, this is a very substantial land holding or lease holding of these runs. And he would own these runs until his death in 1881. Now, the important, one of the important things about John, and it relates to his middle name, what was essentially his middle name, Craycroft. So he was descended on his mother's side, the Craycroft side of the family, from minor landed gentry. And this very much, I think, there's, on the one hand, you've got John as a product of colonialism, and the other, you've got this, this landed gentry background that is shaping who he is and how he leads his life, and therefore how he and Jane lead their lives together as well. So that, and that Craycroft ancestry was very important to him. He named one of the pastoral stations he took up, Craycroft. Um, the house obviously becomes known as Craycroft House. And various children have names that connect, and grandchildren have names that connect back through to that family. And one of, one of the things about John is that he has noted as that basically when he came to New Zealand, that his intention was to establish a noble estate worthy of entailing on his eldest son. So again, very much those aristocratic or gentry ideals. And, you know, 88,000 acres, that's a pretty good inheritance, really, by anyone's reckoning, I would say. Uh, but there's more to John than simply the farming and the, or the run holding. And I, I would note as well in passing that John himself was quite actively involved in this work. He wasn't just, a, he wasn't a hands-off landowner or leaseholder. I mean, he did have managers on the properties, but at Kashmir in particular, he was hands-on in terms of the draining of the swamp that Kashmir was built on. And that's important to note as well from my perspective, because A, in taking up this land, suddenly Māori could no longer access it to, to travel through this area, which if there were, were trails through the area, or to harvest the, the resources, the swamp-based resources that they, they've been getting from that area. And of course, once the swamps are gone, there's even less possibility of that happening. So again, that kind of those forces of colonialism at play and John as a perpetrator of them, that's not really the word I want to use, but somebody who was very involved in that, in that world and that process. Uh, so alongside his um, run holding, John was also a politician. He was involved in politics at the provincial level, at the local government level, and then at the central government level as well throughout his career. Um, his politics were very much to the right. He was described as being Toryism on two legs by his opponents, and he had some 
opinions that today we would find pretty deplorable, particularly when it came to servants, actually. He was quite vociferous about how he felt about servants and their position in the world. Uh, and this is also a little bit typical of John because he was very much, he was a man of very strong opinions and, and unafraid to express them and unafraid of what other people thought of them, or thought of him or them. As I think of him as there's been a lot written about him, as I said, and I think he was a man of great bluster and great energy, but also apparently he was a very kind hearted and generous man and honest, possibly to a fault. So he was involved in lots of activities, as you might expect of somebody who was in that kind of minor landed gentry part of the world or sphere of society, as it were. So he was he was a member of the Agricultural and Pastoral Association. He, he was a very keen flautist. So he was involved in lots of musical production, music. He was a patron of lots of musical events. Uh, he was involved in schools, keeping giving prizes and things at schools. He was also a very keen horse breeder. He was in, involved with the Acclimatization Society and showed a strong interest in importing lots of um, Indian plants and animals to Christchurch. It wasn't entirely successful, as you can imagine. The climate is fairly different, but some things did survive. So John was a very busy, active man, essentially. And the other, the important thing to note, oh, that was the other thing I should have said. That, and so when he died in 1881, John left an estate worth about £200,000, So, which doesn't sound a lot in today's terms, but it put him very much at the, in Canterbury's 1% for the 19th century. This was the wealthiest of the wealthy, essentially. So John had position through social you know, position and status through his political roles through the land holding through his money and through that inherited back that inherited uh the inherited status through that minor landed gentry factor and of course when jane married john she became you know she inherited that status essentially i know far less about her background to be able to share any information about what what she had come from unfortunately all i've got to go on with her really are uh, her activities in 19th century christchurch so let's have a look at some of those now to get a sense of what jane was like so as you would perhaps expect for a woman who was you know she's the upper middle class and the very kind of pinnacle of that. I mean, most I'm saying upper middle class because most historians would say that New Zealand did not have an upper class, that it was upper middle class was as, as high as it got. Um, but she was very much fulfilling those kind of roles that you would expect of a woman in her position. So we've got here some of her charitable works. Um, she and other members of her class went to Littleton following a fire and helped distribute goods to those affected by the fire. She presides over a stall at the St Albans Bazaar for the St Albans Wesleyan Church. And I find that one particularly interesting because Jane was in fact um, um, Anglican by faith, not Methodist. But she's not, in the research I did for my PhD, she was no means the only person who who was of one faith, but helped out other churches, other denominations, I guess. So there's, that, that was, which is quite interesting to me. It wasn't those kind of separate little spheres to reuse that word. Um, then the next one here, this big long article I've got in the middle, uh, this is talking about, this, Jane is a lady visitor for the Charitable Aid Board visiting the orphanage. And there's been quite a bit written by historians and archaeologists about the role of the lady visitor and that they're, it's a very middle, upper middle class thing to do and imposing those upper middle class ideals on working class people who were not necessarily in the least bit interested in them and they just weren't relevant. But in reading this, you can see that Jane is she's genuinely concerned about the girls in the orphanage, that they're not getting the education they might be able to and that they're not getting the food they might be able to. She was quite concerned about the, the lack of meat in their diet and, and, and they had to go from, I think, seven o'clock in the morning until half past 12 without without any food which is that's a reasonably long time really yes uh then you can see there that she was at, acting as a patron for the Christchurch St Cecilia Harmonic Society which were raising funds for charitable purposes and then the last one she and John are the patron of uh, the distinguished patrons of the oh no so, sorry it's only her in this instance not John as a, a distinguished patron of an event for the uh, Scottish rifle volunteers and I should have said that John was quite actively involved in the volunteers that was another key um, 
interest of his, and, and I forgot to say <laughs> that, that John was actually knighted in 1872 for his services in the Indian Revolution uh, and helping put that down, and hence why you see the reference to Lady Wilson rather than Mrs. Craycroft Wilson. So again, that elevation of status through title. But I wanted this... this um, uh, a newspaper clip I've got from the volunteers I wanted to include because it talks about, oh no, maybe it's not that one. There's another one that talks about it being a grand fashionable night and Jane and John were often associated with grand fashionable nights and the advertisements for these events, which talk, obviously I think it's on the next slide, in fact, which I'll bring up now. Yes, down the bottom corner there. Um, it just highlighting the position they held within society, that they were leaders of fashion as well. So in addition to her charitable work, Jane did... A lot of other work as well. It was active in a lot of other spheres as well. With like John, she would often give prizes at schools, and you can see one here where she's giving a prize at the Ferry Road Ferry Road School for a darning competition of all things. Uh, over here, you can see that she's got a uh, she's helping out with the Horticultural Society, and work by Julie King has in New Zealand has shown that women of Jane's class were often it was often involved in horticultural societies. This was considered to be a very acceptable pursuit and, in fact, even encouraged. And Jane does a lot of this presiding at tables at horticultural societies. She also had a very strong interest in, in cricket um, and attended a lot of cricket matches. And you can see here that Lady Wilson, as usual, entertaining her friends and the cricketers in the most hospitable manner. Uh, her other sporting interests were tennis and croquet. And, of course, they're also, I think, sports that we would and easily associate or readily associate with upper middle class people. Um, I've included another two clips here that I particularly like. One is from the Canterbury Archery Club. This is a note because Jane was the lady paramount of the Canterbury Archery Club. But after John's death, she did retire from society a little bit. She, she didn't go to nearly so many of the musical events that she had done previously for a couple of years, but then that ramps up again. But the only thing she actually gives up following his death is this Lady Paramount position at the at the archery club. And I don't, it's, it's led me to wonder slightly if perhaps she wasn't so interested in the archery and maybe that was John's key interest. Uh, and the other thing to note in the final advertisement down at the other corner, is that Jane didn't do everything she was asked to do, which you might have thought from the number of newspaper clippings about her. And in fact, she turned down the, the invitation to be the, the patron of the Christchurch Poultry Association, although I would note some of her counterparts did, in fact, accept such a role. And, and actually, one of Jane's other charitable interests was she had a strong interest in the Society for, of, for Protection of Cruelty to Animals and was quite often involved in presenting prizes there and speaking at the uh, prize givings and annual meetings. So to me, Jane is in many ways what Jim McAloon, who's a New Zealand historian, has referred to as a, a colonial booster, who's kind of a leader in society and promoting all these great things about this this new colony that they've established and this new society that, that the colonial settlers are building. So where does the house fit into all of this? So let's take a more detailed look at it. I've got two images here. I've got the line drawing I've already shown you and I've got another, the black and white image is taken in the 1940s. So the line drawing shows the house as it was in 2012. And just to note the changes from the original. So the bay windows were a later addition. The sash windows you can see on the front there were replaced, they replaced French doors and the original roof was thatched. And so in terms of the materials of this house, it was built from mud brick and with a thatched roof when it was constructed in sort of 1855. And Jane and John had brought with them from India a whole retinue of Indian servants. And that was the Indian servants who formed the mud bricks. And these mud bricks were built on the property, were formed made on the property. So I think of this, this house is very colonial in a number of different ways. And one of them is that I feel like is it's made from the land around it, essentially. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have said that this is perhaps obvious. The fire escapes are, of course, a later addition. They're not original. So you've got this house that's made of these materials from, from the ground that it's sitting on, essentially, and from around it. But it's also very colonial in style. And so the style is what has been what Jeremy Salmon described as uh, stripped down Georgian. Now Georgian is a very colonial style. It comes to the colonies, as you know, from those who from New South Wales in particular, it comes through through Parramatta, and in, it's in Parramatta that the veranda gets added to it. 
and then it comes with the veranda to New Zealand and the mission houses that are built in the north of the North Island are very much in this style and the house that Jane and John build is, is a derivative of that and some of the key features of that that you can see here are the casement windows and the dormers, the dormers themselves, uh, the, the, French, the original French doors which have been replaced obviously, the symmetry, the verandas and inside it had the internal doors were six panel doors which was which was another Georgian feature so the building and so the house is colonial not just in in materials but also in the form that it's been built in uh, the other two things to note about this house are the size of it so this was built in as I say 1855 and it had a minimum of 10 rooms it definitely had more than that I just don't know how many more but based on the evidence that that survived uh, so this is at a time when most people were building houses of sort of two to three rooms I guess so, so or three to four maybe so and I, unfortunately I don't I can't give you a square meterage of this but it, it, trust me it's a big house they could fit a lot of people in it um, it's also a very plain house it's, it's got you might be able well, hopefully you can make out the uh decorative barge boards and the finial on the dormer windows but other than that there's there's very little in the way of decoration well there isn't any other there aren't any other decorative features on the exterior and there was no built-in decoration in the in, on the interior there were no ceiling roses for example it was the yes yeah, so it was a relatively plain dwelling so this, the size was important because it enabled Jane and John to host people. So often um, John's children lived with them from time to time. And this is John's adult children, I should say. And so also grandchildren. So they would, that people would stay for weeks or months on end and other people would pass through and stay there as well. Uh, that it is described as having become the social center for the south side of Christchurch. And certainly I know they, they hosted balls there. Um, John Hall, later Sir John Hall, and a premier of New Zealand, his wife records attending a ball at, at Craycroft House, for example, and I doubt that it was the only one. Uh, in addition, another something that I was intrigued to discover, there were picnics in the grounds at, at Craycroft House, um, and I've got here uh, butchers, bakers, but sadly no candlestick makers. Instead, there are some Germans from Christchurch who had their picnic at Craycroft House. Now, of course, I, I doubt that these people I, or I'm certain that people who went to the picnics did not go into the house. I don't even know if they saw it. This was held, these picnics were held on the 168 acre block that jo John had taken, had been granted at the base of the Port Hills. And it, it could have been anywhere on there, but still it's that sense of that kind of merging of, of public and private, I guess. We've got a private house and the private land, but members of the public are, are able to come onto this land under certain circumstances and it's known to be a nice place to have a picnic and Jane and John are known to be willing to host these picnics and these are all from the early 1880s but this continued through until the 1890s. Jane herself died in 1895, I think I forgot to mention that. So what of the role of this house in, in Jane's life and to a certain extent to John as well? I mean it's to me it it strikes me as particularly interesting because of the the style of it and that these were people with a lot of money they could easily have afforded to pull this house down and build the biggest flashest new house that they wanted to and this I mean even at the time they built it this was not a fashionable style of house and yet Jane was known to, to the, she's recorded by one of the women who stayed with her as being one of the leaders of fashion in society and yet they don't trouble to build a fashionable house and so I wonder if they keep this house and keep living in it and keep using it and the family live in it up until World War II the descendants uh, to as a kind of it's part of that kind of idea of old money and it's saying the style of the house was saying that we were we were here first in a European sense obviously and that it's it, it's a it's part of that kind of their deriving status from their early arrival and their and that kind of that sense of age that you get from the house I suppose and I also wondered if perhaps it's a more a more rural style of house than a townhouse and that might have co co or coalesced with the ideas about establishing this noble estate with the, of the landed gentry that's you know you've got it has to have a farmhouse at the center or a manor house rather than a, a city house for example 
So this house for Jane would have been a site of work. She would have organized the balls. So I'm sure she helped with the organization of the pic picnic. She would, she would have, she had servants. So she would have managed her servants. Obviously she hosted guests who stayed with her. She would have had to have overseen all of that. So it is a site of that domestic work. But I think more than that, it's just, it would have been a source of social power for her and status because she was using it to host balls and to entertain people and to demonstrate her status in society to the world as a whole. The next two women I'm going to talk about are quite different from Jane Wilson and that, that they both worked. And we're going to start with Mrs. Sarah Galtz. So Sarah was born in 1850 in Antrim in Ireland, and she arrived here in Christchurch in 1883. And she arrived with her parents, Davis and Mary, and her siblings, Maria, Matilda, and David, and her son, Alexander. What, who, the person who's not mentioned in here is her daughter, Elizabeth, who also came with her. And the other person that's not mentioned is her husband. And I don't know, there's some suggestion that her husband may have stayed in Ireland and not and they, they separated essentially, uh, but I cannot prove that. And it may simply be that he had died and she was a widow. There's, I can't tell either way, unfortunately, which is frustrating, but there's not much you can do about that. So by 1884, Sarah was advertising herself as a dressmaker in the local papers. And by 1885, she'd moved into this house at the east end of Gloucester Street. For those of you who know Christchurch, this is still within the central, within the central city, but it, it's on the kind of suburban outskirts of it. But still a good central location. So this was a brand new rental property that uh, Sarah moved into. And in fact, it was, you can, it was identical to the one next door that you can just make out the edge of there. They were, obviously, they were not no longer looking quite so identical by the time they were demolished in 2011, but they'd started out that way. So the location of this is important. It's relatively, uh, relatively central, but so too is the style and appearance of this house. So it's, 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 it is, in fact, a bay cottage in form, but it looked like a bay villa, which by this point in time was the, the coming thing in Christchurch. It was just it was a form that was just becoming fashionable. It was probably more likely to be associated with the middle class than the working class. And you can see there are some basic kind of features associated with it. Obviously, you've got the bay itself, you've got the window decorations, and then you've got the, barge bo uh, the decorative barge boards and the finials above. So the fact of Sarah choosing to rent this fashionable looking house would have told her clients, so I should explain, I'm sorry, that dressmaking in the 19th century was a profession or an occupation, it was a women's occupation, men were tailors, uh, and women tended to carry out that business at home for most of the 19th century, although things had begun to change by the, by the end of that period. It, and there's, a, there's a, a raft of reasons why, but one of them is, of course, that it enabled you to, to you could work as a dressmaker from home and still look after young children who weren't in school, essentially. And, Jane, and Sarah, sorry, of course, had two young children, so this would have been ideal for her. So, yes, her clients would have come to this house to be measured and fitted and to take their finished product away. And on arriving at this house, they would have seen that Sarah understood what was fashionable at the time and therefore would be able to help them understand what was fashionable and to make them fashionable dresses. At least this is my reading of it. It's, it I could be completely wrong, of course, but this to me is what I think is going on with this house. And it is notable that this house and the identical one next door were both occupied by quite a number of dressmakers during the, the 19th century. So when the clients went, customers went inside, what would they have seen? Well, on the left here, you've got the hallway. So this photograph is taken looking at the front door down the hall. So you've got that hall arch there, which typically is seen as separating the, the public rooms in front of that from the private rooms behind it. So the, the customers would never have gone beyond that hall arch. So they would never have seen the rest of the house. And, and this, so this demarcation was quite important in terms of, again, it was, a, it was a fashionable thing to have, and it shows that you understand the niceties of societies, and not, but not all houses by any stretch of the imagination had a hall arch. I can't remember the percentage from my sample, but I don't think it even reached 50%. So they're not an entirely common feature. But as well, in front of the in front of that hall arch, the three rooms, so the hall and the two, the room on either side, they each had a ceiling rose and they also had these plinth blocks that you can see down the bottom of the, by the door architrave. 
uh, on the doorways. But those features, those, those features did not exist beyond the hall arch, which of course the clients, the customers would never have known because they would never have entered that space. But again, it's just highlight, these features were fashionable features, they were decorative. And again, for uh, Sarah's clients, just highlighting that she understood what was fashionable and she could help them be fashionable. And as I said, um, Sarah would have operated her business from home and we can see a little bit of evidence of that in these advertisements where Sarah is advertising for apprentices and improvers. And the other important thing about this is that it tells me that, Jane, that Sarah's business was quite successful. If she needed to employ staff and she's looking for two apprentices in one case there, yeah, that, that, that she's, she's doing well for herself. Um, but the frequency with which these ads appeared was somewhat surprising to me. I've just put a selection up, but there was pretty much one for every year that Sarah moved into that house. So she moved in in 1885, she moved out in 1890. So they were they appeared on a fairly regular basis. And there is some suggestion as to why that might have been. She might not have been the best person to work for. Um, you can see here she was charged on two occasions for... Um, breaking labour laws, essentially, which I think, again, probably highlights how busy she was with work, that there were so many people who needed her services. And the other interesting thing for me is that people chose to complain, that people chose to lay a complaint about this, which, you know, doesn't necessarily always happen. So, as I said, uh, Sarah lives here until 1890 and she moves on and her business continues to grow and actually does really well. So while she's living in Gloucester Street, she never actually advertises the business, her services as a dressmaker, but she moves on to Cashel Street, still in a residential area, still working from home, and begins to take up much bigger kind of a, a, you know takes up big advertisements in the paper advertising her servants, her services, and she also advertises for servants. So she's obviously doing really well for herself, which tells me again that she had. She was making clothes that people wanted at a price that people wanted and that she had, you know, a certain degree, well, not a certain degree, a good degree of business acumen. She was doing really well for herself. So what, how does the house fit into all of this? I mean, I think I've probably explained that all pretty well so far, but in terms of the fashionability, but I think for Sarah, this house would have been a source of independence that enabled her to practice her occupation in a good location and in in a, in a property that was fashionable. It was also obviously the house was a place of work, both of domestic work, of looking after her children and all the kind of regular kind of care and maintenance of a house that has to take place, but also the commercial paid work that she was taking on and a location where other women obviously work too, the apprentices and the improvers. Um, and also the other thing to note about this, of course, is that Sarah, as I said, had come to New Zealand without a husband. Uh, her parents were in her father was in his early 70s when they landed here so I don't think he would ever have worked in Christchurch I haven't been able to find much evidence of what her siblings did so I don't know if they would have been in a position to support her but essentially she was a woman on her own in a society without any social welfare and she had to work to survive so in some ways this house is also about economic survival for her well, the last woman I'm going to talk about is Mrs Lizzie Palmer who was also involved in the dressmaking trade. I don't know if she was actually a dressmaker by, by training, but that she certainly entered the, this trade, as, as we'll see. So this is the what's not, in fact, the first house that Lizzie and her husband, Habez, lived in when they got to Christchurch, but they this was the first house that Habez owned when they moved to the, when after they'd settled in the city. So initially they lived in a rental property. While they were living in the rental property, they built this house and Habez was in fact a joiner. So he may have built this house himself. Then having built this house, they bought the cottage or he bought the cottage that they'd previously been living in and they were able to rent it out. So they've already got the income coming in from another house essentially. So this house was in what is now Beveridge Street and it was all, it was a, a very working class part of the city it was a small narrow street occupied by lots of people with working class occupations with houses like this and this house is very much it's it was the most common house type in the the sample I looked at for my thesis so I called it a square villa or a standard villa and it, it's it's the kind of bread and butter Christchurch house as much as anything commonly built by people who are with working class or middle class occupations as Habez was as a joiner. So by so this house had six rooms, including the hall. 
in the various other service rooms it had. And by 1886, there were, they had five children living in this house. There were three boys and two girls. And I suspect that the house was probably built with the intention that one of the rooms would be a parlor, but with the makeup of the family, it would have been more likely to have functioned as a bedroom. So the family lived here until the early 20th century because in 1900, Lizzie took over Mrs. Campbell's fur repair shop on Colombo Street. And I've just got some advertisements here about the business sort of indicating what it made. Now, the important thing about this is that in, this is, was the case, yeah, in 1906, 1907, the premises that Lizzie was operating from, this operating this business from, was demolished and replaced. And this is what was built on the site in 1907. I don't know where Lizzie operated from when, while this was being built, but, but this is where she ended up. And what's really useful to, about this particular, so this is what the facade is. Now, Lizzie's shop was in the, the shop on the far left here and on the next slide I've got the floor plans of this building so over here I've got this is the ground floor and then this is the first floor as it's labeled and Lizzie was in shop one um, but what happens is that and this and this might have been the case before this building was built but I've not been able to prove it but essentially Lizzie's family Lizzie and her husband and her three 20, three children who are in their 20s move into the room above shop one. So this is a very small space. So they've gone from living in a working class street with a, uh, in a standalone house of their own uh, to living up above the shop. Now I should note in passing, they keep that house that they were living in on Beverage Street and the little cottage there that they're, and they rent both of those out. So again, a source of income, but they move in to live above their business. And this is, this would have been considered to be a step backwards socially, status wise, because suddenly they've gone, they're now living above their place of work. But I like to see this as Lizzie having a plan. I, I can't say for certain that it was Lizzie who had the plan. It, it, she and her beds may have come up with it together or it, it might have been his, but I think because of what happened subsequently that it was probably Lizzie. But the fact remains, this would have been, even the social stuff aside, this would have been a really small space for essentially five adults to live in. It can't have been the most pleasant of, of, of situations. And I just wanted to highlight to you um, how, because, because, Christchurch street addresses are really difficult to deal with, as any of you who have done historical research in Christchurch will know, um, how I was able to pin down which shop Lizzie lived in or worked in. So these on the left, you've got, this is a photograph taken not long after the earthquakes of that building that which uh, her shop was in that survived until the earthquakes. And then where the veranda had fallen away, you can just make out the Palmers. So this was from Lizzie's store, which was a lovely reminder of her of her premises, although obviously long gone now, sadly. But Lizzie's store was obviously pretty successful because in 1910, she bought a property herself and it, the, the deed is in her name. So she bought a property at what is now 29 Gloucester Street. So unlike Sarah's property, which was at the east end of Gloucester Street, this was at the west end of Gloucester Street. And you can just make out the 29 here. This is the house that she bought uh, from the, the, the this area was from the 1960s. So it's yeah, so she she buys it. So the, the important thing about this is that the west end of Gloucester Street is the posh part of Central City Christchurch. If you're wealthy and you want to live in the central city, this is where you're going to live. So near just over the road, you've got uh Hagley Park, you've got the Botanic Gardens, you've got Christ College, which is a very prominent boys' boarding boarding school, you've got the Christchurch, uh, the Canterbury Museum, the university is nearby at that point. There's also Cranmer Square. There's lots of green space around. There's the river there as well. And there are lots of educational institutes, institutions. I've named just two, but there were lots more of your boarding schools in this area. So this is this is a very desirable part of town to be living in. So it's a long way, a very long way at, um, socially and financially from Beveridge Street and from that first house that I showed you. So Beveridge Street being very working class in character and this area is anything but. Of course, it was also a very convenient location for Lizzie. She could still walk to work quite easily from here. That wouldn't have been a problem. 
And not only does Lizzie's business enable her to buy this house and land, it also enables her to buy a property with a house in New Brighton, which was considered, which is a seaside suburb, and was considered to be a little bit of a, a seaside resort at that particular point in time. She buys that in 1916. So for me, Lizzie's house, or the, or the different build, or different houses that she lived in. It's a little bit like Sierra's story, where these properties, these houses, are they're a source of income as well. They would have been a source of domestic work as well, but they're, and they're, but they're also a, mean, a tool in many ways. They're a means of improvement. They're a way to get ahead in society, whether, it, whether that's just economically or it's socially as well. I don't know enough about the family to know if the social aspect mattered, but presumably the financial aspect it did. I mean, everybody, that's, as Jamie Balich has observed, everyone who came to New Zealand came here for a better way of life and certainly seeking to improve the circumstances for their family. And I think that was very much Lizzie's aim with, and I do think because Lizzie is the person who purchases these properties, I think it is her who is driving this, but could well be wrong. So I hope that what I've shown you with these, talking about these three women is the different roles that a house can and fill in someone's life in the sense that yes for these women these houses would have been a space of domestic work they would have been a site of display where they you know entertained and in uh, Jane's case she would have been entertaining people at balls and to, you know friends and colleagues and family etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, Sarah would have been welcoming her clients into her house so there's the, there is that aspect of the house of or that kind of domestic sphere, I suppose. But these houses were also much more than that as well. In Sarah's case, they were, uh, sorry, in Jane's case, they were a source of social power and status. Whereas for Lizzie and Sarah, it was much more about economics and independence and making a way for themselves in this new, in this new city that they found themselves in. And at a bigger level, I think it showed looking at the houses in this way and looking at the house as a whole rather than just the individual rooms. And it shows that yeah, that houses weren't, as I say, just a saw, just a place of domestic work or display for women. They could be so much more than that. And of course, the stories I've told you tonight are all kind of success stories, I guess, for a want of, you know, things ended well for these women. But there were certainly examples from my sample where this wasn't the case, but I didn't have nearly as much historical information about those women to, to fully understand the relationship between them and their house. But I, I hope what I've shared with you tonight has made you think differently about how a, a, a woman in Victorian Christchurch might have seen her home and might have used her home. And that, as I say, it was far more than just a domestic space. So I just want to thank you all for listening and being here tonight. And I've just got some acknowledgements of the sources of the images that I've used. So thank you. Great. Thank you, um, Catherine. That was fabulous. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you could either use the reactions button at the bottom of the screen to um, raise your hand or if you could pop the quest, a question into the chat, um, if you have any questions for Catherine. I had one, Catherine, which was really related to your, your closing remarks there in terms of the successful stories versus if you like the unsuccessful stories. I mean, I think, I think what you've demonstrated very strongly is that that initial model that, that you um, showed us, it's possible to critique it because as with many things in, in life, um, there's a multiple kind of, um, you know, everything is multi-centered. It's never, it's never just um, one, one or the other. It's not a dichotomy. It's actually life is more complicated and complex than that. Um, but what I, what I wondered was, I mean, we've kind of gone from the extreme of literally, you know, the lady, um, the, the married to the person with the knighthood, um, through to the kind of working class making good and, and leapfrogging, as it were, into the, into the middle class. Um, did you have the opportunity in your research to trace any of that further? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that if these families persisted in these locations into the 20th century, you may not have gone for that, but I just wondered if there was a process of the springboarding of then the generations um, 
you, you know that 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 somebody somebody makes good and then if they've got the educational institutions around them the next generation perhaps makes it to university or you know that I, I, for, my shorthand for it would be social climbing but that's that's a disparaging term and that's not really what I mean but you may not have had the resources in your work to pursue that but I wonder if there are any clues about that I did a little bit for Lizzie in particular because her story so intrigued me and actually and I, I it ends a little bit sadly she has I think of her children who survived to adulthood I think there are only there are two girls and two boys survived to adulthood from memory and she leaves the shop to the two girls to run at her death uh, and they sell it in 1925 and they both die childless so and then I think only one of her one of her sons has a child so in, in many ways almost the family line dies out and the other thing that uh, I did amused me about this was and I think this is perhaps partly why I delved into her family history a little bit more was that she left her son I think it was something like 500 pounds but he wasn't to be able to access it for something like 15 years until he was in his fit for, late 40s or 50s so I wondered what that said about his ability to manage money <laughs> but, or, or her perspective on it so so yes, I don't, I, and I don't know any more than that. I think the the Craycroft Wilsons or the Wilsons certainly persist, although I think I don't think any of the family kind of achieved that the kind of giddy heights that Jane and John did, as it were. Right. Um, thank you for that. I'm not sure if you could see the chat, um, Catherine, or not, but um, I can bring it up. Yeah. Um, we we have a we have a question um, from Gretel, um, where she's asking. If for your last example, um, the Palmers, the final house was also about status and moving up in the world. Yes, I think so. Unfortunately, I can't. I've only the only image I have of it is that 1960s aerial, so I can't tell what the front of it looks like, which would help me understand that a lot more. It certainly looks bigger than the, the Beverage Street property, and but it is of the same basic form, being a standard villa, so it's still. That yeah, it, that hasn't changed much, but I think yes, definitely that yeah, there's a state. Well, I I assume that there's probably a status component to it. Yes, right. And and we've got a comment here from um Anne Marie, which it's not a question, but she's saying there's a family kind of connection. Um, that her great grandfather was a friend of um, Mr. Sir Wilson, and he named one of his daughters Jane Wilson. Ah, oh, that's really cool. Like, it's nice because I, I was so surprised that nothing of her, or I couldn't find anything of hers that survived given the prominence of the family and the couple in the city. You know, I thought the museum might have had something. I mean, to be fair, I didn't delve very deeply, but there was there was nothing immediately obvious. And, and to not even have a photograph of her was really startling given her position, but yeah. Yeah, you kind of expect one of those great 19th century family photos of all of them yes. on the veranda or something, wouldn't you? You know. Like, yes, and I'm sure such a thing probably exists, but probably held within the family. Ish. Yeah, and we, we've got another um, question here from Mary Ann. Did you research who filed the court proceedings against Sarah? Um, and one of, one of the, the follow-up bits is it would be interesting to know if it was the husband of her workers due to their wives not being home in time perform their role as wife in their own home oh hi Marianne it's nice to see that you're here but um yeah I didn't actually look at the court proceedings I only looked at those newspaper articles but yes that's quite an interesting point it, it would be interesting to know or a father or somebody like that who was yes yes it would be, it would be interesting to look into that um and then we've got Jane Rook um who's thanking you for the for the great talk um but she wondered if any of the properties were excavated and if the artefacts then confirmed the activities in the houses that you've talked about. Sadly, no. We've got it's for all the work that we did on 19th century houses post-earthquake in Christchurch, very few did we actually do excavation to get much in the way of artifacts. So yeah, it would, it would be my dream to buy, have a house like this and have the artifacts that go with it and to be able to marry all of those sources of data up together. Um, and we've got another comment really about the concept of that arch, the hallway arch in Sarah's house, separating her spheres, public and work from private and home. And 
I, I, I thought that was a really interesting observation too, Catherine, um, because that that kind of aesthetic but obvious demarcation, you know, when, when you mentioned that the visitors would know not to go beyond that point, um, you know, it was, a, it was kind of a, a physical, a non-physical barrier that was a physical barrier. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's a really, <laughs> yes, and, and Fiona, it's nice to see you here as well. It was a really clear marker that you, yeah, this was where you were stopping and you would not go any further. I think some people have suggested that people would put curtains across there if they didn't have the arch. I've not come across any evidence of that, but it's certainly possible to fill that same function, but in a far more obvious way. Oh, great. And then from Eva, we've got a question, which you can probably see there, um, yes. Catherine. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, Eva. Um, no, I didn't find any evidence like that although I, I did discover and I don't know this will perhaps resonate with some of you that um just at the point I was submitting my thesis I discovered that um there were there was a notebook of John Craycroft Wilson's at the Canterbury Museum but by then it was far too late to do anything about it but it would be really interesting to look at that and I think that is possibly the original source of the idea that John was looking wanting to establish that you know this this noble estate to entail on his son um yeah yeah I mean that 200,000 pounds is a massive amount of money it's huge I, I meant to run the conversion through the the New Zealand website that does that before this and I I completely forgot <laughs> but but yeah it's it's a it's a vast sum of money yeah and then we've got another comment there um from DZ um which is a bit um cryptic um, about a single woman needing to own her own home to avoid poverty and this advice mm -hmm. from the 1960s, 1970s. I, th I think that's coming out really strongly now at the moment, actually. We have a lot of commentary in Australia about, you know, that women, because they don't earn an income as continuously as men, um, you know, the, the growing kind of older poor people, um, it's disproportionately women. Um, because they don't have superannuation accumulated to the same level, et cetera. So, uh, and the comment there is also whether that's, you know, it's such a critical need, I suppose, that it's more important than the sphere of the work or or not work. Um, do, you, do you have any comment on that? I guess, I, yeah, yes, I mean, yes, it's right. And that, that, that what owning a house can give you, I mean, as we, as you say, as we can see today, is just huge in terms of that kind of leverage, I suppose, or that base. And I mean, the other interesting thing for me is from the research carried out for the Cavisham project in Dunedin that shows that it was so, you know, again, in the 19th century, it was just so much harder for women to be on their own. And where men would often, if they were widowed, they would more often than not they'd be remarried within a year whereas women were much less likely to remarry and were much more dependent on other people and that that loss of independence and especially if you've got children as well just becomes so difficult and then we've got a couple of comments about that that issue with the archway and the, and the curtain um so it does seem that that's the most likely kind of oh, yeah. yeah um physical evidence or barrier that would be there um and then a whole lot of really fantastic comments congratulating you on, on the, the great talk. Um, so if anyone has a question, I'm going to give you your last chance to either pop it in the chat or gesture. Oh, here we go. Here's one from Ebony. Hi, Ebony. Um, do many of these old houses survive? Uh, increasingly few. There was actually an article in the local paper in the weekend, I think, or last week, talking about how they were disappearing in Linwood. It was just, you know, these, yeah, they, I mean, I, I live in an old house and it's wonderful, but it's also horrible, especially at this time of the year, it's cold, it's very cold. <laughs> but it's, so there are problems with old houses like this, obviously, and it can be much easier for a developer just to, to rip them down than to try and renovate them. Although obviously you can start to think about the environmental costs of that as well. And there are a whole lot of issues there, but, is there any focus on studying them? Not that I'm aware of, unfortunately, but there's, yeah, I mean, obviously they get recorded through the archaeological process if they were built prior to 1900. But the other thing that I noticed in the floor plan of the shops um, when they move in, there only seem to be fireplaces in two of those upstairs rooms. 
Yes. <laughs> and I don't know, I would have to go back through my photos from that early demolition phase to see if fireplaces had been added to others or to look at aerial photographs to see if there's evidence of chimneys because it, it would have been impossible to live in those in there without some kind of heat. Christ yeah, just I, in place. But that, that's the, what I was thinking. I was thinking, but it snows. <laughs> yes, it snows and there are frosts. And, <laughs> yes. And we've got, we've got a, another late entry question down here about the construction materials of the houses. Um, I, I think sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, so, so well, obviously, um, so Craycroft House was mud brick walls with a thatched roof. Um, the Sarah's house was weatherboard with a corrugated iron roof and then the first house well, yeah the, the house in Beverage Street that Lizzie lived in was weatherboard as well then the brick shops and then I, I I would guess that the next one was timber as well because that's what was the most common building material in 19th century Christchurch all right I, I think I will close it there because otherwise we'll keep you up all night um answering questions but um, someone's just snuck a message in oh no it's just a congratulations on the really interesting talk so thank you very much everybody for attending the asha seminar thank you very much um dr Catherine wilson for um giving us your time and your expertise and sharing your knowledge um with all of us tonight it's really appreciated great and well thank you very much for attending everybody it was, was it was fun to do and i hope you enjoyed it and i hope you learned something mm -hmm.